sometimes I adjust my iPhone like that too. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work too well. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. good to see each one of you here uh, today. Uh, this is a very special day uh, because it is a gift from our Heavenly Father. Amen. And uh, there's only so many of these that He allots to each one of us. And uh, this is a day that He's given us to come and, and worship and, and praise Him and, and seek His face. What, a, what an awesome opportunity and freedom we have to be able to come and do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just appreciate you coming and uh, continue to be grateful for all that God is doing. Um, today we're going to continue in the book of Joshua and we're going to be uh, looking at chapter 5 of Joshua. Um, the Israelites are in a process. Um, just like we're in a process. And um, the Lord is leading them unto uh, the promised land. A land that, that He is in fact giving them. And uh, we see how God works within the Israelites' lives. And we, we can glean things from this. Uh, how He works in our lives ultimately to get us to the ultimate promised land. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where uh, we desire to go and that's where we can go. Uh, because of um, the sacrifice of His one and only Son, Jesus Christ. And, uh, they're in this process, and they've, they've crossed the Jordan, and um, God's performed a, another miracle of uh, stopping the, the flow of the Jordan River uh, when it was at flood stage. And uh, last week, we, we thought about precious memories, how there in the midst of this miracle, um, God led Joshua uh, to get some of the leaders, 12 of the leaders of the people of the Israelites, and, and to take up uh, some stones out of the middle of the Jordan, exactly where the priests were standing when the water was, was stopped. And uh, we, we talked about the importance of these precious memories, uh, these miracles that God does, and that we need to remember that because it is, it is for the journey ahead. It is for the battle that lies ahead. It is for the the difficulties that lie ahead, that we need these precious memories. And uh, today we're going to be uh, looking at a, a thought process that I think we find in, in Joshua chapter 5. And uh, here in the middle of, of God carrying His people into this land of promise, uh, He calls for a, a commitment. He calls for a commitment in Joshua chapter 5. And we're going to read uh, this chapter together, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over, their hearts melted and they no longer had courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that He had solemnly promised their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So He raised up their sons in their place. And these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from, from you. So the place has been called Gilgal, to this day. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, 
they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna from, uh, for the Israelites, but that year they ate of the produce of Canaan. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Let's pray again. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we do uh, count it an honor and a great privilege, uh, Father, to be able to gather here uh, together in this place, Lord, to to worship you and, and Lord just praise you God and seek your face Father we come with a, a resolve uh, Lord that your grace is enough uh, Father just to know you and Lord to be known by you uh, Lord that is that is enough Father we thank you uh, that out of your love and grace and mercy uh, Lord you have uh, made a way for us uh, to walk in intimate fellowship and relationship with yourself. I thank you, Lord, for starting that process within our lives uh, by faith through grace. And I thank you, Lord, for carrying it to completion, Lord, not in our ability or strength, but in the power of your Holy Spirit. And, uh, Father, I just ask that you would just continue, Lord, to work in each of our hearts. And, uh, God, I pray that each one of us would have a willingness, God, just to uh, continue to die into our flesh, Lord, as we live more and more unto you. And, Father, we uh, just recognize, uh, Lord, the importance of this work within our lives because we look about us. And, Father, there are many who are broken. And there are many who are walking as sheep going to slaughter. And, uh, Father, they know not uh, what lies ahead. Lord, they bought into deception. They bought into to lies. They bought into this world. And, uh, Father, I know the prince of this world has, has blinded their minds. And, uh, Father, we, we just uh, cry out unto you for, on their behalf, uh, Father, that, that, Lord, you would just help us to, to stand in our day. And, uh, Lord, to be the the watchmen that cry out, the, the warning, the gospel. And uh, Father, I do pray that you would continue to, to open the eyes of the blind. I pray, God, that you would continue to, uh, Lord, give hearts of flesh, replacing the hearts of stone. Father, I pray that you would continue to, to raise the dead to life as people come to know you. And uh, Father, I pray that you would continue to do all of these things, Lord, for your honor and for your glory and praise. Uh, Father, we just want to lay ourselves down at this very moment. And uh, Father, I thank you for the opportunity to worship through song. And God, as we come to this time just to hear from you, uh, Father, I pray that you would speak, uh, Lord, as you do uh, within our lives. And I pray that we would hear. And I pray, dear God, that we would be challenged, Lord, uh, from your throne room, God, just to to continue, Lord, to, to take the steps that you desire us to. And Father, as we are convicted, as we are brought in the light, as truth is revealed, uh, Father, I just pray that as we uh, submit unto you and as we obey, uh, God, I pray that you would be on me. Father, we love you, and uh, God, I just thank you uh, for this precious opportunity to uh, Lord, proclaim your word. Father, may it go forth with clarity, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Most military strategists would agree that in the Israelites' campaign of going into the promised land, 
that this is not a time to stop. This is not a time for them to pause. They have just crossed the Jordan River. God performed a, a, a miracle. And uh, it, it, would, it would stand to reason that the natural thing for them to do is to, to go on in and, and start the campaign. You know, taking over the land. But God caused them to pause. He causes them to stop. You and I need to understand that God is more interested in our walk with Him than the battles that lie ahead. Mm -hmm. We think that it's all about getting things done. We think that it's all about continuing this process. When God many times will cause us to pause with many things to do and many things to be accomplished, He will cause us to pause. And in those times of pause, God will call us to commitment. Listen, God's work in our life is not always logical. God does not always look for a convenient time in our life. Sometimes it's the most inconvenient times in which we have many things, even things of God to be accomplished that God will say, wait a minute, wait a minute, pause, stop. And in those times, God will do a hard examination to see where we are with Him because that is crucially important as God unfolds His will and unfolds His plan within our lives that our hearts continue to grow and we continue to be and show forth to be God's people in full commitment unto Him. Now, we recognize that there is the activity of God uh, continuing in the lives of His people. As they cross the Jordan in verse 1, we see that, that the fear of the Lord goes out through the land. The fear of the Lord. I mean, here we have God working in advance of His people. You and I can be assured that God is always working in advance of us. God's all, all, already uh, planning the victories. He's already uh, unfolding the process of the victories that He's going to bring within our life and for our lives. And we can trust Him in that. And we, can, we need to recognize that. We need to see that. And here in verse 1 we see that, that, that the fear of the Lord is falling upon the, the people of the land. And we think sometimes we've got to accomplish what, what God's wanting us to do. Listen, what God calls us to do is not up to us. God can handle the victories. He can handle the battles. He can handle the things that lie ahead. But what God's interested in in our lives is this. Where is our commitment? Where is our hearts? Well, here in the book of Joshua, in the midst of this most inconvenient time, uh, God calls the people of Israel to a, a commitment. Notice if you would in there, there in verse 2. It says, at that time, the most awkward time for them in this military cam campaign, at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. Now circumcision was an outward sign of an inward commitment of God's people. It, it is a commitment that God called His people to when He made a covenant with Abraham. You remember uh, the father of faith, Abraham, uh, in Genesis 17, uh, verse 6 through 11, we find this covenant uh, that God made with His people. It says, uh, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you 
and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and the descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. It's an outward sign of an inward commitment. That's what it was. Now, it's important for us to understand that physical circumcision, it is a sign of the spiritual circumcision that every human being needs. Mm -hmm. In Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, it says, A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19, it says, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's command is what counts. Amen. Circumcision was an outward sign of an inward commitment to the covenant that God had made with His people. And here, as we look at the unfolding of God's will for His people and what He had foretold, that He was going to give them the land of Canaan, He performs this great miracle of stopping the Jordan River. He, he tells them, look, make some precious memories, and then before they advance into the battle, going on about the business of what they're there to do, He says, stop. I need to know how committed you are. You need to circumcise the people. There needs to be an outward sign of the inward commitment. There's no way for you and I to get around this truth. What's in our heart will be seen in our life. Amen. Our commitment to God will unfold in, in outward signs of our commitment to Him. And that's what God calls His people to right here in this most inconvenient time. If you know anything about circumcision, especially for those who are older, it could be a very painful process. This could make the Israelites very vulnerable to the enemy. What if they are attacked during this time of obedience? Friend, you and I need to understand the sovereignty of God. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that, that God is the Lord God Almighty. If He calls us to do something, He's able to keep us. Amen. He's able to protect us. But what He is most interested in in our lives is our commitment to Him. The outward must come from the inner. The outward must come from the inner. And some get caught up in just doing the outward. And they go through the religious practice. And listen, we need to understand that that will be seen in all of our lives as false. But something that's inward, it will stand the test of time. And it will test, stand the test of every situation and circumstance that God brings us into. We will go through. Why? Because outward must come from inward. It must come from inward. Mm. God calls His people to a time of commitment. <laughs> now, we need to understand that everyone must personally answer the call to commitment. Every one of us. We must personally answer this call. Notice if you would, back over in our, our text of Joshua chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. It says, So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. There's a new generation. 
And they must answer the call of God to commitment. Now the forefathers of the Israelites, many of those who came out of Egypt, they, they had the outward sign, but it didn't come from the inward commitment. Mm. And it was told as they lived life, as they, they were faced with challenges and, and opportunities in their life. Listen, they, they disobeyed God. They did not trust God. That was that generation. Now there's a new generation. And they're being called to a, a time of commitment. And they must answer that call personally. Personally. Every individual must personally answer the call of commitment. Amen. Just because one generation may be does not guarantee that the next one will. And just because one generation before was not does not mean that the next generation will not. Every individual must answer this call. And listen, it must, it must be a call of commitment answered. Yes, I am committed to you from my heart. And yes, the outward signs come from that commitment. What if we commit? What if we have the outward sign that comes from the inner commitment? There's some results. There's some things that will, that will be true. There are some things that, that come along with this relationship with God and this, this heartfelt, seated commitment unto Him. There's some results that come and we find them in our text. First of all, there is forgiveness. There's forgiveness. Notice if you would in verse 9, it says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, so the place has been called Gilgal to this day. <laughs> Forgiveness. The reproach is, is rolled away. Colossians 2, verse 13, it says, When you were dead in your sins and in the, uh, in the uh, uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ, he forgave us all our sins. You know what torments the soul of man? Unforgiveness. The lack of peace with God. Man, when there is a, a committed heart to God, and there are the outward signs from that inward commitment, listen, there is forgiveness. There is cleansing. There is peace no matter what's going on around and no matter what God may lead us into and through. Listen, there is a deep-seated peace of forgiveness that comes along with the answered call to commitment. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, it says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offer Himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences? from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Man, one of the benefits of a, a, a answer call to commitment to God, I mean full commitment to God, I mean wholehearted commitment unto God, is this reality of cleansed conscience and forgiveness in which we can serve and walk with the living Lord. I want you to understand that the excitement that we have as believers, it doesn't come from something we build up and make up. It's something that lives within us that must come out. It's that forgiveness. It's that rejoicing. Man, we can't help but worship and praise our God and live for Him because of the difference He's made with Him. Mm -hmm. From a whole heart of commitment, forgiveness, peace, inner peace. And let me just say that this world can't buy. Amen. What is the results of answering the call to commitment? Well, there's forgiveness. There's also worship and fellowship with God. Worship and fellowship with God. There is a huge difference in knowing about God and know God. Amen. Mm. Huge difference. Amen. And let me just say that that worship of God and fellowship with God 
doesn't have anything to do with beat. Worship and fellowship with God has to do with our heart. Amen? Our heart. Man, let me just tell you, it doesn't matter what kind of music we have or what kind of believers or God congregating, I can worship my Lord. Mm. You know why? Because it comes from the heart. It's not about the outward, it's about the, the inward. And whenever God gives us this call of commitment and we answer it wholeheartedly and it has the outflow, the results of, of, of outward signs within our life, listen, there is real worship and there's real fellowship with the living God. It's no longer just a religious mundane thing that, that sometimes we just force our way through. Man, it's something we can't wait to be a part. And we long to be a part of eternally with God. Notice if you would in verse 10 of the text. It says, On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. And I want you to understand that that celebration, it wasn't an old dry celebration that we just got to do this because God asked us to do it. Man, they had seen the activity of God. They had heard the voice of God. Would you commit to me wholeheartedly? What about this generation? What about you? What are you going to do? And they answered that call from an inward commitment with the outward results of the sign of their commitment. And listen, they worshiped and they fellowshiped with God. And it was something that came from within. And I believe God's calling a generation in America today mm -hmm. to commitment. I'm not talking about religious routine. I'm talking about commitment. You know why things are growing cold in many of our gatherings across the land? It's because, listen, there's not a wholehearted commitment that has this, this worship and fellowship with Almighty God. Man, when you get a bunch of people together that have fully committed to God and listen, they are clean before Him, they worship Him and they don't argue about what's this and what's that. They just worship God because they have fellowship. They, they know God just like Job says, I know God, not just about God, but they know Him. Man, I'm here to tell you, when there's an inward commitment, there's real worship. Amen. Amen. There's real fellowship with the living God of the universe. The third result is this. Blessing. Blessing. Look if you would in verse 11 and 12. It says the day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land. Unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. Blessing. For 40 years they've been eating these thin flakes of bread. Sweet bread that God would rain down every night. And they ate it day after day after day. Thank God for the provision that He does provide. Amen. But they got tired of that man. Can you imagine? Even your most favorite food. Every day, all day, for 40 years. Man, I tell you what. There's some food that I absolutely love, but if I've got to eat it three or four times a month, it can get old after a month or two. For 40 years, they ate now. And this generation is called to a point of commitment. And they commit from their heart. They're sold out. God, your plan, your way, that's it. There's no more Egypt. There's no more on the other side of the Jordan. Listen, we're going forward. We are committed. And once they get across and they have worship and fellowship with God, man, there's a blessing. 
Now there's a lot of people, they get caught up on the blessing part. There's a lot of people, their motivation is all about the blessing. Listen, you can't be committed to God if you're focused on blessing. There's a whole new gospel being proclaimed that it's, it's all about God blessing us. It's about bargaining with God and, and jockeying with God, trying to get God to bless us. And the focus of blessing is all about the worldly and not the eternal. You need to understand that you can't bargain your way into God's blessing. And things of this world are not necessarily the greatest blessings. The greatest blessing is knowing God. Amen. The greatest blessing is knowing that you're going to be with God forever and ever and ever. Listen, that's the greatest blessing. It's the spiritual things that God does within our lives, within our hearts. That's not religion, but they're real and they're personal. They're intimate. But I'm here to tell you that when we fully commit to God, when our heart is all about Him and His kingdom, there's no way around it. God will bless us. Doesn't always have to do with circumstances. The blessings, His presence all the time. Man, you remember the fruit from the land of Canaan? I mean, there's one cluster of grapes that two of the spies brought back and took both of them to carry it. This is a land flowing with milk and honey. And once this generation answers the call to commitment, man, the man stops. And they eat. Of the fruit of the land. There's a blessing. If we, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more? Amen. Our Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. Our motivation is not for what He's going to do. Our motivation is just Him. His grace is enough. His grace is enough. And man, when His grace is enough and that's sincere within our hearts, God will bless His people. Mm -hmm. The answer call to commitment from an inward heart with the outward sign. There is forgiveness. There is worship and fellowship with God. There is blessing. And finally, I would say this. There is a divine commander. A divine commander to bring direction and victory in every battle You know, one of the greatest truths of the gospel is when we're committed to God, we don't have to do this thing called life. We don't have to do this thing called ministry. We don't have to do this thing, period, without God. He goes before the battles are His. Amen. They're His. Listen, we can trust His sovereignty in opening and closing doors of making the way of winning the battles. It's all about us remaining in Him and letting Him give the direction and the victory in His time for His name. Notice in verse 13, it says, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemy?" Notice the answer. Neither. Hmm. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Listen, don't miss this. There's so many people that want God on their side. God's not interested in being on our side. Amen. Amen. God's interested in us being on His side. And if we are fully committed to Him, we are on His side, and the commander of the army of the Lord will fight the battles of the Lord. And let me just tell you, the victory is already won. Amen. It's already won. It, it's a matter of heart, and it's a matter of perspective. Man, when we are fully surrendered unto God, there is the commander of the Lord that we line up in submission behind, and He goes before us, and He shows the way, and He fights the battles, and He will win. Mm -hmm. So many people asking, Lord, are you on our side or the devil's side? There's good people. There's people that, that really want to know about the Lord, and they're asking the Lord, are you on our side or are you on the enemy's side? And He says, I'm on neither. I'm on my side. Mm -hmm. See, it's all about God. 
It's all about Him. It's all about His will. It's all about Him being glorified. It's all about His name. It's all about His kingdom. And the question is, whose side are we on? And man, if our hearts are fully committed unto Him, there is a commander leading us. The commander of the Lord's army. Show the way. Fighting the battles. And man, this life, this Christian life, it's as easy as the faith of the child. It's that easy. We have responsibility. We got to obey. When he speaks, we need to obey. But listen, we've got the wrong perspective in our day. We're thinking we've got to fight for God's kingdom. No, we don't. We have to answer a call. And it's a call to commitment. And the answer to that call, it'll determine the battles that lie ahead. They're not ours. They're His. When we're fully committed to Him. God doesn't look for convenient times. God doesn't look for logical times. God works in the middle of life. The activity of God needs to be recognized. I think most everybody that's here, you can say, man, there's no doubt God Man, he's on his throne and he's doing work. <laughs> we all recognize there's a lot of things to do in our lives personally, in our lives collectively. Man, there's so many things that lie ahead. And God sometimes with so much to do, he says, stop. Hit the pause button. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Where's the commitment? I want a wholehearted commitment in the outward signs that come from it. Don't focus on the outward signs to bring about the heart commitment. The heart commitment has to be there. In your personal walk with God, in your husband-wives relationships in your family unit in the gathering of believers that God's brought you in one accord to to serve Him in the community that He's called each one of us to side are you on? I'm on my side. And when we're on his side with a whole hearted commitment, 
All we do is fall behind Him and walk in the victory. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Call for commitment is a challenge. Where's our heart? How committed? How committed? How deep does your commitment go? Are there limits? Things you, man, you really, you don't want to give up, you don't want to do without. Areas that are still off limit to God. There's a call for each one of us. We must personally answer the call. With everything in your life open to God. Everything in your life surrender to God. The results but the focus 